I'm going to go ahead and, it, uh, and record the meeting as we begin here today. Uh, because it, uh, there's a number of people that won't be able to join us for the meeting today, and it, uh, they're very much interested in, um, in uh, some of the information we'll be sharing today. So it, uh, we are indeed uh, being recorded, and I'll, uh, I'll post this, I'll composite this and post this a little bit later here. Thank everyone for joining, and welcome to spring, and welcome to April. Uh, by the way, my first um, opening slide that you're seeing here, just in terms of the share, is meant to be just a common reminder to all of us, is that we are in the digital age, and communications in the digital age is a bit of a conundrum in that we may think, right, that the easiest way is just to tap out an email, you know, whenever we at, uh, have something to say and something to share, and it may not be the best way to communicate a particular issue. And so um, uh, uh, those of us that have grown up, you know, and it, uh, spent a lot of time in technology, we learn pretty quickly that, um, that email has flaws and weaknesses with respect to sharing particular types of information. And so I want to encourage all of us, right, just in general here, that, um, you know, that it's, it's very important that we think about, um, you know, that we think about um, uh, uh, um, uh, what we want to share and what means of communication we want, uh, we think is going to be best uh, sharing before we type it out and uh, hit send. At that point, um, here we are on April 13th, um, we have a full agenda. You know, we'll go through our regular announcements, our regular updates. Um, and again, a lot of announcements coming from a lot of people. Um, Joey Holbert is here from WSU and he'll be sharing us about uh, tree pathology and a particular program of um, citizen science that he's launching and uh, wants our participation in. Uh, we'll be following this meeting with a board meeting, and I want to encourage everyone to stay on for the board meeting uh, if interested, because we have a lot to discuss there, including a proposal that uh, to uh, refresh our website that will be presented by Craig Lawrence, who will be joining us uh, for the meeting at that time. So to begin, let's celebrate a few birthdays here. Midge, Anne, Karen, Brenda, Rachel, and Gloria all have birthdays this month. And Anne, I don't know if you're on here today, but happy birthday today. So it is interesting, by the way, when you start looking across the, uh, the all of the birthdays across all of our members, um, April's a particularly skinny month, right, with only six birthdays across our members. So it is a rather interesting that um, some months are, are chock full of master gardeners and it, uh, many others are, or many others are less. A quick reminder, by the way, for everyone, uh, we all are here as master gardeners, and as master gardeners, we commit ourselves to the principles and the programs of, uh, of the uh, WSU Extension Program, known as the Master Gardener Program, and we follow the precepts of the Master Gardener Handbook in that regard. This is different from our participation here today as a Master Gardener Foundation. So as a Master Gardener Foundation, reminder that we are a separate 501c3 corporation. We are a Washington nonprofit corporation. And as such, you know, at, uh, what we do, right, is that, uh, is that we can do things at, uh, such as um, fundraise to help support our programs and come together as, at, uh, as members uh, to share and to learn. To that point, you know, your foundation elected board is here. Uh, we have election reminder, we have elections every October per our bylaws, every October for our bylaws for one year uh, uh, terms for all of these roles. And it, uh, we look forward to everyone's participation and, that, um, and uh, in, in these volunteer roles as we think about, you know, as we think about the next, um, as we think about uh, 2022, which will be coming up uh, quite, uh, you know, surprisingly <laughs> quickly here uh, that, uh, in terms of how time marches on. Very important, of course, is your volunteer support. And that, uh, John, Margie, Terry, and Cindy, all who lead these committee programs here will very much value your contributions, your volunteer contributions of support. And I encourage everyone to recognize that we're members of a service organization. As master gardeners, we are indeed um, uh, expected, right, to participate and volunteer our services in so many different ways. And we have so many different opportunities to serve the public uh, through, these, uh, through these committee programs. So uh, our liaison educator, our faculty liaison with WSU is Tony Gwynn, based out of South Bend. 
and our coordinator is Alina Riccatini. Um, we have an option for an additional coordinator, additional program coordinator. So a shout out to anyone with, uh, wishing or interested in participating with us, you know, as it uh, as a coordinator. Uh, and it, uh, there's an honorarium associated with that re with that role. And uh, Alina would certainly appreciate assistance um, in that we've got a lot of people. Think about it. We cover 3,500 square miles, and it um, you know across at, uh, the two counties, and that's a lot of area and a lot of responsibility for just one coordinator. So reminder also, of course, to record your hours. Now, this is quite interesting, by the way, because the WSU volunteer database, the uh, screenshot that you're looking at now, is going to be changing this year. Um, there's a new WSU website called Give Pulse. Give Pulse. It's all one word. In fact, you can do a search on WSU Give Pulse, and that'll take you to the new website. Um, we're going to be talking about that Give Pulse website in the board meeting uh, that's just going to be following this meeting here. That will be the new uh, website location for recording hours. And um, it's expected that actually in over the next few months, we'll all be transitioning to the Give Pulse website for entering of the hours. Um, it's actually very similar to what uh, the current uh, website is all about um, here, but it's, um, it is a much more refreshed and uh, modern looking uh, website um, interface. More on that as we come into uh, to, um, up, upcoming, um, um, upcoming months. So April to do's, these of course come from Oregon State. Um, OSU uh, has a monthly garden calendar. I encourage you to check these things out. Um, they're, they're very well prepared and there's a lot of great imagery by the way and other great recommendations and links on that OSU site for every month of the year. Um, it is interesting that uh, as we get into April, they're starting to talk about when you can get serious about plantings. And it's interesting that talk about when soil is consistently above 60 degrees, right? You know, it's time to start some of your warm season vegetables. Remember last month, we started talking about starting cold season vegetables when your temperature is above 50 degrees. And it's a uh, shout out then to the WSU um, uh, Ag Weather Net site. WSU maintains Ag Weather Net that has a whole bunch of great information on it, including soil temperatures at all of the WSU monitoring stations across the state. And so um, just checking yesterday, Montesano has the last seven days averaging 45.8 degrees in their soil at the eight inch level. Grayland is topping 50 and Long Beach is almost there at 50. So we're a ways away from 60 degrees uh, soil temps. Um, and it, uh, I would imagine that in our hoop houses or greenhouses, you're certainly able to get 60 degree temperatures, if not more. Uh, but we're a ways away from being able to have a plantable uh, outdoor soils per, uh, per these temps. Reminder, of course, on maintenance and cleanup, um, spring flowering uh, bulbs, spring blooming shrubs, times to clean and so forth, pruning and shaping after the blossoms fade. Um, I was noticing in my own landscape this morning, a lot of work is needed. Um, I've got weeds coming up and this is the time to, uh, to obviously pay attention to weeds prior to them uh, flowering and establishing themselves well. Um, reminder on uh, the fertilizing of lawns. Um, it's a good time, springtime. And, it, uh, and of course, uh, one pound of nitrogen per a thousand square feet, unless you're running a golf course in which you'll double or triple or quadruple that. <laughs> Um, note the mark about guarding against late spring frost. And it is interesting if, again, if you look upon it, uh, any sort of uh, uh, maps across the, at, uh, across the state, um, we could have frost here as late as uh, early May. Uh, and especially at, uh, as you get into some of the interior, you know, some of the, um, you know, if you look up where Elma and it, uh, over in the Rochester area, you could have a, you could have a frost as, as late as late May. So uh, cautions with respect to, uh, you know, when to plant and, uh, and when to be concerned about, um, about uh, a cold weather frost. Although we got to admit that um, uh, this, well, shoot, I, we should say uh, this week alone, right, we've had some uh, temperatures in the 20s in the, the Puget Sound area. And yet we're going to end the week with temperatures in the high 70s. So it, uh, it's quite a variable time weather-wise. 
pest monitoring and directions reminder to uh, to make sure that you it, uh, if you've got a pest you know what you're treating uh, if you've got a problem that you know what the issue is um, you know uh, to, there's there's it's, uh, some uh, great references here this managing disease in insects and home orchards is actually a very well readable um, uh, 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 treatise on it uh, on home orchard management. I know that we here in Pacific County get a lot of requests from people with small uh, small orchards about when best to prune, when best to treat um, uh, various pests, and when best to spray. So um, uh, um, I encourage us to make sure that we're up to speed on the official uh, WSU or OSU publications regarding uh, regarding treatment uh, uh, treatment plans. Planning and propagation, um, you know, recommendations from OSU to uh, selectively start the vegetable garden. And it, uh, I know that, uh, you know, I know that uh, we here have, um, you know, lettuces and onion sets ready to go, um, uh, very carefully trying to, to nurture those seedlings along. Um, you know, and so, it, uh, you know, we're going to see that uh, as we get into April and May, uh, you know, the planning recommendations are really coming up. You know, for it, uh, for full, uh, you know, for full setups. Uh, quick shout out, by the way, with respect to the uh, the winter weather. Again, going back to the WSU Ag WeatherNet website, um, they track the entire calendar, the entire winter precipitation calendar from October through March, right? Which is our official winter uh, precipitation uh, at, um, uh, 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 calendar. And uh, yeah, what we thought was a wet winter was indeed a wet winter, right? Look at Montesano, a good five inches ahead of their average. Uh, you know, same sort of, you know, the, the same sort of the, the stats in at uh, Grayland and Long Beach as well. It was truly a wet winter. And, it, um, and it's interesting, by the way, is that just as we have experienced a very wet winter here in Northwest, uh, the Pacific Northwest and specifically in Grays Harbor and Pacific counties, um, I was just reading yesterday upon it, uh, you know, the drought that uh, the Southwest United States, and in particular the interior Southwest in Arizona, New Mexico, and parts of Nevada, um, they're about to experience one of the worst droughts um, in the last hundred years. So it, uh, it's interesting the contrast in where the precipitation is occurring, and it, uh, and indeed the above average. Uh, precipitation we're experiencing and the significantly below average precipitation that's happening at um, that's happening at uh, elsewhere. Okay, looking ahead for our own calendar for the foundation reminder that we're demonstration gardens and our community beds uh, in Elma in Owaco, South Bend and Ocean Shores are ready for your volunteer services and reach out to the coordinators who are managing those gardens or beds for when and how best to participate in the volunteer capacity. Reminder that WSU does have restrictions and constraints upon when, how, how many folks can gather at any one time for the kind of, um, the kind of work, uh, the kind of distancing that needs to occur when we're working in the gardens and in the beds. Holman Garden Show, you know, normally scheduled for the, uh, the, the weekend after Mother's Day is again canceled, canceled for this year. So the 2021 Home and Garden Show has indeed been canceled. Um, we are hoping uh, to, to actually resurrect some of those activities later in the, plant, in, the, the, in the garden tour. Shout out to the Mother's Day plant sale that will be occurring across two weekends. The weekend before Mother's Day, May 1st and 2nd, as well as on Saturday, May 8th in Ocean Shores. So at, um, uh, uh, Terry, if you're on, do you have any other comments you want to share with respect to the Mother's Day plant sale? There, okay. Uh, yes, it's, uh, the planters are looking exciting. I had lots of uh, great help uh, to plant this year. Um, I'm very thankful that so many of our members have gotten vaccinated. Um, and uh, they'll look very beautiful in a couple of weeks in time for the plant sale. They're fluffing up right now. We also have some interesting, um, I don't know if, if people remember from, a, I think maybe about four years ago at the Home and Garden Show, we had some really creative and interesting planters, hanging planters made out of floats. And, and so um, the uh, 
owner of the greenhouse who um, was a fisherman for many years, collected a lot of floats and has um, um, created some really, really wonderful planters that we will also have for sale. Most excellent. A shout out um, to you, Terry. And again, uh, at, um, uh, are you looking for any volunteers or some, uh, folks to help you with the plant sale on, uh, on the first or second? Uh, yes, I could use a few more uh, helpers on uh, May 1st and 2nd. Um, I, I have, uh, have a few people so far for both days, but um, I could really use one or two more. Or three or four. <laughs> Reminder everyone that this is a this is a major fundraiser for the foundation and if indeed you can participate in helping uh, Terry for that sale on the first or the second or with Sushila in the May 8th sale in Ocean Shores do reach out. Uh, we've been very successful in the past with these sales and again the planners at uh, those of you who, who, who know what uh, Terry and team have produced. I mean they really are exceptionally beautiful and it uh, we've enjoyed. Uh, we personally have enjoyed buying them and giving them away as gifts just because they're such a great appreciation for neighbors and as a thank you for it uh, for other folks. Okay. And then at, uh, and then of course the, uh, the, the big garden tour that was at, uh, pushed off from last year will again, will be held is we're planning on holding it this year. And Terry, do we have a firm date uh, as to when we plan to have the garden tour in Satsip this year? I didn't mean to send Terry away. <laughs> so I think we're planning, we're actually planning on, uh, on, on having the garden tour on a, on a date TBD in August, hoping uh, to, yeah, go ahead, I please. I just unmuted, I just yeah. unmuted, sorry, Kelly. Um, we're still planning on July 24th. Okay. Okay, so it'll be on July 24th then, so not in August. So we'll hold up to the July 24th date. And it, uh, you know, it, uh, and so, it, uh, and we'll, and we'll have, we'll have more updates on that as we get closer. To that point, reminder: at that garden tour date on July 24th, on July 24th, we will have a a plant sale as well as a kind of a mini, uh, a, a mini home and garden uh, booth setup. Uh, that will be at a special uh, location there. And a uh, shout out and reminder to all of us that here's an opportunity for us to contribute to that plant sale by taking time now to take plants in our landscape today, dividing them up and at, uh, having them ready, you know, for July 24th uh, plant sale at that time. So a shout out uh, to all of us for the contributions we all can make to that effort. Okay. Uh, Trish couldn't join us here this morning, but wanted to make a strong recommendation that time's running out. Time's running out to, uh, to, for, to, uh, for students here, for <laughs> graduating seniors in Grace Harbor and Pacific counties to apply for our scholarship. Um, um, Trish says she's got a couple of um, applications in already, but obviously we're looking for a lot more. And, it, uh, and we've got $1,000 we're willing to share to a deserving graduating senior. So this is the time to get those that, um, you know, so if, if indeed you know of a senior or you know of, a, of an individual that might uh, benefit from the scholarship, um, let's get them going in terms, of, uh, um, in terms of applying for the scholarship. Okay, reaching out to all for any other announcements, other announcements across the group here. If you wanna unmute yourself, uh, at, uh, mind you, you can always unmute yourself temporarily by holding down your space bar, holding down the space bar in Zoom, temporarily unmutes you while you're holding down that space bar. Uh, Kelly, I have an announcement. Um, for all of the foundation members out there that can join our uh, North Beach chapter Zoom meeting Thursday at seven, uh, I'll be posting a, a Zoom, which I haven't done yet, <laughs> the Zoom uh, link uh, for anybody that wants to join us in the North Beach chapter. And again, uh, to Kelly's earlier point, we do need volunteers for the May 8th plant sale uh, and we'll stagger, uh, stagger it like every two hours or something for any volunteers out there that wanna earn some hours. That was it. 
Most excellent. Lots of things happening up in Ocean Shores. And so that's next Thursday. You're saying that's Thursday, April 15th at 7 p.m. You'll have an Ocean Shores Zoom, a North Beach Zoom. Yes. Very good. Expect news on that. Other announcements? Uh, yes, this is, uh, can you hear me? We certainly can, Rick. Uh, this is Rick Honrider. And uh, I was talking to Katie this morning. She was on KXRO this morning uh, talking about the uh, workshop we are going to be having at 6 p.m. on Thursday evening. And uh, you have to go on the our website to sign up for this. And everyone is welcome to join, of course. And uh, so she was on the radio this morning. And uh, she will be on the radio again on Thursday at KBKW at 1450 and at 9 p.m. 9 a.m. 9 a.m. <laughs> with Doug uh, McDowell. And, uh, and of course, you could uh, you can uh, email to Doug at KBKW any questions you might have to ask Katie at that time. And I know she talked about the scholarship this morning on the air, and she, of course, talked about the workshop and uh, the information about the uh, Mother's Day plant sale. She didn't have the exact details, so I'll get back together with her and tell her. And if Terry wants to relay any more uh, advertising messages to Katie, just contact Katie directly before she goes on the air this Thursday. Okay. Um, actually, I have a question about that. Um, we haven't had official approval from um, WSU yet for this event. Um, it's going through, you know, we have this new form we have to fill out. Yes, I'm aware. I'm aware of that the whole okay. thing. There. Yeah. That's yeah. why I'm it. So that's been it's my firm. to give you any details about it. So you don't want us to go on the air with it right now then, correct? Um, I think I need to discuss it at the board meeting. Okay. Okay. So we'll, you know, so more later on that. But again, that uh, reminder then that we've got a workshop this Thursday, the 15th at 6 p.m. And details are on our website, pnwmg.org. Thank you, Rick. Thank Other you. announcements. Um, this is Karen. Hello, Karen. Hi. Um, I don't know if anybody is interested. I missed last meeting, so um, hopefully Aaron or um, Sharon talked about the fact that the conference this year is going to be virtual. Did you get that? We did, yes. Yeah. So that the state conference is going to be a virtual conference, and that's going to be on, I believe, on that's that's the uh, September thirtieth through October first, correct? Correct. October I believe 2nd, that's October second. Yeah. And um, our conference next year is going to be at the Red Lion. They've already confirmed. They've kept the rates the same. They've they the Red Lion has been great. So next year. 2022, the conference will be in Olympia at Very the good. Red Line. So again, so CE hours, you know, readily available virtually this year, September 30th through October 2nd. And Correct. I believe um, registration for that, you know, that hasn't opened up yet. We're, we still, we're still some weeks away from registration. I, I was thinking that they said they were going to start in April, but I haven't gone and looked at the website, so I'm not sure. I'm on the site selection committee, and so that's how I know about the other stuff. But very good. I think they're waiting. Sorry to interrupt. I think they're waiting to open registration until they have firmed up the um, company that they're going to use for to host the oh, online. So yeah. it should be. I would say within a month. I mean, I know they're shooting. I think yeah. they're shooting for early May. Yeah, I'm sure. I think they're shooting for May. Yes. Okay. Very good. Alina, announcements. Yes, I just wanted to uh, bring everybody up to date on Give Pulse, which is the new data entry system that we are going to be using in the coming months. And I think uh, Kelly's going to talk a little bit more about it later on in the meeting, but I just wanted to let you know that it's still happening. And um, I'm working with the Washington State Program Coordinator to get this up and going. So you'll be getting an announcement pretty soon. 
So just what we've always wanted, right? Is more a new website to learn. But it, uh, other announcements. Yeah, reminder about the Trillium experience this weekend at Lake Sylvia. It's going to be a drop-in sort of a thing from one to three. We'll, there will be some folks in the big new pavilion with displays and then you can do a self-guided tour and it's the trilliums are out, they're beautiful. There's some other stuff blooming too. You know, Helen, that's a great point. We think our trilliums are, they, they're, they are coming out, they are beautiful this year, but they're late this year, are they not? Uh, it seems like the middle of April is about right. Um, they're, they're about where they usually are, I think. I don't know. They, they come and then kaboom, they're all there. And then there's still more coming out. And I don't know. And of course, a shout out to that new, what uh, the new pavilion there at Lake Sylvia. If you've, if, if anyone have not, if has not been up there, um, take the drive up there and experience it uh, with the trilliums this weekend. Other announcements. I want to note that um, um, Kathleen that uh, Schaefer made a comment that there's a, some CE opportunities available starting even tonight. Um, uh, there's a couple of uh, Zoom events, uh, one tonight. David Droppers is talking about moths. Uh, and at, uh, coming up the, at, in the middle of May, uh, Linda Chalker Scott from WSU will be at uh, you know, presenting nursery school, how to select the best plants for your landscape. That's on May 18th. So at, uh, both of these registrations can be made at uh, the Washington Native Plant Society's website. So that's wnps.org, wnps.org. So at, uh, check out, you know, check out both of these events. Um, as you know, that uh, WNPS, the Native Plant Society programs are really excellent programs. And uh, they will be, well, I can, I can, I can unabashedly avouch that they'll, they'll be worth your while. Couple other comments I wanted to make here with respect to what um, uh, 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 fishing scams we've 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 uh, made about these we've made these notes before we've made these comments before, and it, uh, I want to keep reminding um, all of our folks here to be alert for scams coming across emails. Um, you know, there's just there's there's it's just it's it's a fact of life in our digital age here is that we've got um, uh, uh, you know folks are are trying to. Get your personal information and get your contact information. If you um, you're gonna you're gonna see a lot of emails that may look official uh, as from official websites, or in most recent cases, you may be receiving emails that look like they're coming from someone whom you know. Uh, and it uh, uh, and it, uh, in particular, we've had a flurry across the country of. Uh, very recent gift card scam emails that are coming, that are coming out. And the FTC has uh, just put out, they actually just put out some alerts here saying that we're, we're seeing a, a rash of these imposter scams. And it, um, and I tell you, if any, you know, that the, the general rule is what you see there in the, the highlight, if, if, um, if anyone is telling you to pay by gift card or send money or give personal information, it's a sure sign of a scam. And I wanna make a special note that uh, uh, Mary Shane, uh, she, she and I spoke just last evening and she wants me to explicitly make it known to all of you on the call here today that, um, that uh, you know, uh, she apologizes for any confusion, but um, uh, it certainly, you know, she was a victim of the scam and certainly was not trying to perpetuate any of the scam. Uh, many of uh, you have received emails from someone's email address looking like Mary Shane's address, asking for a gift card, um, and, it, uh, and that uh, Mary wants everyone to know that she was a victim of the scam, and she certainly wasn't trying to uh, trigger a scam activity. And then the final comment with respect to uh, uh, email uh, is that uh, depending upon your email client, Depending upon your email client, um, there are ways to block senders as well as to whitelist senders. And a, a whitelist sender is someone whom your email client will always be willing to accept. And you certainly want them always be willing to accept an email from John Coogan or from Katie Lutz to make sure that you're receiving all of our communications from the foundation standpoint. 
And at, uh, you, if, if there's any senders you want to block, uh, junk mail senders or at, uh, crankies, uh, cranky uh, uh, senders, you certainly can do that. But again, it's just, it's all a message of, it's all a matter of uh, doing this at, um, you know, at, um, uh, through your own email client. Hey, Kelly, I would like to add that in the latest edition of ARP, I'm sure a lot of us get ARP. <laughs> I do. Indeed. Um, yeah, in the April issue, there was a whole uh, several pages of Inside the Fraud Factory. And I wanted to say that don't ever let anybody take control of your con computer if you're having problems trying to repair it, unless you know for a fact that it's a reputable uh, person, you know, because if you read this article, you never let anybody can take control of your computer, except maybe Kelly. <laughs> and, uh, and it was frightening to read these stories of how people got scammed out of so much money just for computer repairs. So anyways, that's, that was my yeah, so Sheila, that's, a, that's a great caution. And I encourage everyone, if, even if you don't get the AARP bulletin, uh, go online and then read the article. And it, uh, so again, uh, uh, you know, digital hygiene in this 21st century is a necessary part of what it's all about here. So it, uh, I appreciate that it is important for us to be schooled and well-educated on how to make sure that we are not being scammed. And a uh, quick shout out then for next month's program on May 11th, we will again be meeting via Zoom and we'll be joined by Doug Collins. Doug Collins is a WC Extension uh, Specialist up in Puyallup. And, it, uh, and uh, with, uh, there's been all kinds of discussions that I know that we've all had as, as foundation members over this past, over the past few months talking about, you know, hey, just what is the ideal composition of soil? How much, you know, how much organic material should be in there? And it, uh, Doug and I spoke um, uh, last week and he's prepared to share with us uh, a fairly exhaustive detail of it. You know, how do you actually put together kind of that ideal soil levels? He's actually quite fascinated, by the way, in, in, uh, in actually speaking with us here in Southwest Washington, because uh, of course, coming from Puyallup or Mount Vernon or different areas, it's a much more verdant and rich fertile soil than what we typically have here in, uh, in Grace Harbor and Pacific County. So he's actually quite fascinated and looks forward to sharing with us uh, soil composition and soil amendment text, uh, tips. With that, by the way, uh, I want to welcome, you know, our, you know, the, uh, I, I, you know, Joey, I know you're with us here, and I'm, I'm going to give you the share, screen sharing opportunities here in a second here, but I got to admit, it just seems so colloquial to be referring to you as Joey Holbert, right, you know, as opposed to, don't you think Dr. Holbert would be a far more appropriate, you know, an authoritative way to reference and bring yourself, you know, bring your credibility to us all? And Joey, you're, you're still on. Yeah, go ahead, please. Uh, I guess I, I prefer to, to be personal with you all. So it's nice, <laughs> it's nice to meet you all on a personal level. So, um, to, yeah, so Jerry, I'm going to go ahead and it, uh, allow, allow you to, to share your, do you have any, any screen as you want to share here? Yes. Okay, so let me, it, uh, there you go. So you should be able to share a screen here. Okay. Um, yeah, thanks for the opportunity. I'm really grateful to be here. And this is, it seems like a really great group with a lot of energy. So um, I'm happy to be here. Let me, I'm going to test how my, my dog does. He's kind of needy. I might just take him downstairs real fast before we begin, but um, that's okay. We're welcome. We we welcome the pet. <laughs> we welcome your we welcome your your sidekick if that's going to be helpful for you. I, but again, I I, we we welcome you by the way, and we're very much looking forward to your program here because I, I understand this is a program that you actually initiated back in South Africa during so uh, doing some work here, and you're trying to bring it forward here. Uh, sort of. I I did a similar project in South Africa as part of my PhD degree, and now we're kind of extending what I learned in a completely new way, but. Um, but it's 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 similar a similar approach to plant disease research, I suppose. Um, but yeah, let me get just stick my dog downstairs real quick. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, no worries. <laughs> While we're waiting for Joey to move his dog, is any any other uh, any other announcements and so forth? Any other last minute uh, comments or any additional sharing you want to have?
any other great tips for spring that anyone wants to share or any other great new plant sightings or great excitement that they're looking forward to? Okay. Well, Joey, you're back with us. Okay, great. And you can still see my screen? We certainly can. Um, Um, can you see the full screen? We can see the full screen now, yes. Okay. All right, great. Um, and just a reminder for everyone out there, indeed, if indeed you want to maximize the screen you're sharing and minimize, go ahead and minimize the, uh, the thumbnails that may be off to the side there. So if you want to uh, uh, you know, make sure that you're maximizing the screen, you can actually, you can actually move the window. There's a slider um, in your Zoom window to actually uh, maximize the screen and minimize the, the thumbnails. Yeah, yeah, I understand. It can be kind of tricky moving the video around and and um, and, and also seeing the full screen. But um, and I'm happy to pause if any of you have trouble seeing anything. Let me know. Um, feel free to speak up. Um, and thanks so much, Kelly, for for inviting me to be here and organizing this. Um, how, I guess, for um, just to keep me in time with your meeting, how long would you like me to keep this limited to? Well, I'd like to try to keep, you know, it, uh, we, we need to uh, 20 to 20 minutes, 20, 30 minutes or so. It'd be great. Okay. And then as, as, yeah. as, we, as we spoke about, you know, one of the things we talked about is you having, having you back for a workshop later in May. That'd be lovely. Um, yeah. And I think when I, when I introduce myself now, you'll, you'll kind of, have an idea of what I can offer or, or how, what expertise I'm here as a resource to you all. Um, so I'm just gonna briefly introduce myself and talk about this program called the Forest Health Watch that we've initiated. And, and our focus right now is on Western red cedar dieback, um, but there's a lot of room to grow and, and focus on other plant health or tree health issues that you may be concerned about. Um, and I'm just gonna highlight a little bit of how, um, how community scientists have contributed already. Um, and then we'll talk about how that fits into the big picture of, of aiding and finding a solution and accelerating research um, to ensure that Western Red Cedar remains on the landscape for future generations. Um, I'm coming to you now from Tacoma, actually, but I'm based at the Puyallup Research and Extension Center, much like your next speaker, Doug Collins. Um, and there, it's important that we acknowledge that we're, we're actually studying and learning and um, exploring and researching on the traditional homelands of the Piaup tribe of Indians. And we're just super privileged to be in this beautiful, okay. beautiful area. And as, as Kelly mentioned, with some nice rich soil um, and great forests. But it's really a pleasure to be engaging with you all um, down here as well in the, you know, in, in the Pacific counties and in, in Grace Harbor. So um, I, again, really am um, just super grateful to be here and appreciate it. And I welcome you all to contact me individually or follow up with me if I can be of any service to, to you and your county. Um, and I don't know if you've explored this. This is a tool produced, um, it's an open source tool out of Canada called nativeland.ca, but you can actually just explore a Google map and it shows you which territories you, you may occupy or, or in, um, explore. So for example, here, it looks like you're part of this Chehalis tribe or you're that kind of in these traditional lands of this Chehalis tribe. Um, all right, so I'm going to briefly introduce myself. I'm, I actually got a bachelor's at, at WSU in 2010, and, and I studied forestry and natural resources. After that, I went to Oregon State for a while, and I was working on a master's. Um, and there I, I started learning about tree diseases and forest health, and I was studying a disease called sudden oak death, which is a... Um, a microorganism that's killing tan oak trees in the southwest corner of Oregon and then much of California as well. Um, and then after that, I went to South Africa, as Kelly had mentioned, and I, I did a PhD in South Africa um, between 2015 and I, I just came back 2020, last February, a little more than a year ago. Fortunately, just before things started locking down. Once I came back, I, I was very 
lucky to um, begin working at the Pialp Tribe, or excuse me, at the Pialp Research and Extension Center. Um, and I'm part there, I'm part of a program called the Ornamental Plant Pathology Program. And I'm gonna highlight a little bit of our research just purely so that you know we're all a resource <laughs> to you all. Um, and I, before I do that, I wanna acknowledge that I am, I'm, I'm here and I have the privilege to be here because I have support from the USDA in a, in a fellowship provided by the National Institute of Food and Ag. And so um, we're really grateful for that support. So in Pialop, I am a postdoctoral fellow with support from USDA. And I'm mentored by this gentleman named Gary Chastagner, um, who's really an expert in conifer diseases and tr Christmas trees, um, and as well as ornamental bulbs. He does a lot of um, bulb, like plant disease research on ornamental bulbs. Um, we also work with ornamental plant trade like nurseries that grow um, rhododendrons and some of the other species that are propagated for ornamental purposes. Uh, Marianne Elliott is a research associate who's also a, an incredible mentor of mine. And she leads some neat initiatives like the Arbutus Army, which I'll mention um, in case you have a, a sincere appreciation for madrone trees, like a lot of us here in the, the Puyallup area. And I just wanna highlight that we, have a new director at the Pialp Research and Extension Center, and he has a an exceptional and robust background in um, in integrated pest management and specifically with tree insects and and um, and tree pests. And um, the reason I wanted to present all of these and all of my mentors um, is because there really is a nice pool of expert expertise based in Pialp on tree health issues and and tree. Um, diseases and insects. So feel free to use us as a resource. Um, we're here. You can contact us um, through WSU Extension web pages and things like that. I'm just going to quickly highlight a couple of our, our focuses, or the foci of our research programs. Um, one, I mentioned we work with ornamental plant trade um, and, and nurseries to, to ensure that they're, they're producing healthy stock and not accidentally spreading microorganisms or plant pathogens around with the, with the trade of these plants. Um, we also have a, a Christmas tree research program where we work with Christmas tree growers to control insects and diseases um, in Christmas tree productions um, and troubleshoot some issues that some growers are having. Similarly to my master's project in sudden oak death, we also work a little bit with this group of microorganisms called Phytophthora. Um, it's the group that causes sudden oak death, as well as a few other issues, diseases in the, in the region, most primarily mo mostly root rots. Um, but again, we work with the ornamental plant trade um, to ensure that we're not accidentally spreading microbes that, that cause diseases like sudden oak death. And if you, you see um, this is a tan oak tree where you peel away the bark and you see these really clear lesions. Um, that's characteristic of a Phytophthora infection. Um, and sometimes you might see that in the root color of your rhododendron or your um, or, or some other ornamental woody plants. Um, we also have a really cool program on Madrone. Um, we have a what we call a common garden where we've established plantings from um, seed that was collected from 119 different families. And, and um, in Puyallup, we have two gardens like this. And we have, there's also five or six sites between British Columbia and Oregon where we have these plantings. And so we're looking for one madrone that is tolerant or more resistant to this leaf blight and, and the diseases we see with the foliage of madrone. And then also um, looking for ones that are best adapted for our climates in this region. And if you love Madrone, um, as I mentioned earlier, we have this community initiative called the Arbutus Army, which is a really cool collective of people that are just love Madrone. And so um, we have a newsletter and things like that that just highlight Madrone um, or Madrona um, types, of, types of events and, and, and news articles. Um, last November, we also organized a webinar series with four scientists that are doing research on Madrone. And so um, we really encourage you to check that out. It's arbutusarmy.org. And we call it the army um, because it's the shorthand for the Arbutus menzici um, or menziciae. 
um, which is essentially the scientific name. So the short shorthand for the scientific name is ARMY. So now I'm gonna briefly introduce this Forest Health Watch program that we've established. And it's essentially um, extending what we do to the general public and to folks like you and ensuring that we're, there's a space to, to report concerns or, or find solutions or answers. Um, so I encourage you to, to view our webpage. It's foresthealth.org. Um, there's a lot of different ways that you can get involved that I'll highlight. We have a lot of great partners that have helped contribute to shape this program into something um, that will help the region and help maintain healthy forests and healthy trees in the region. Um, so we're super grateful for, for a lot of our partners and, and support. So I mentioned that there's a lot of room to grow. Um, right now, um, we, we really want the Forest Health Watch program to be an umbrella for multiple forest health projects. But right now, we're purely focused on this dieback of Western Red Cedar because it's been identified as a primary issue for a lot of our partners. And, and um, I'll, I'll speak a little bit more about that. And we've also heard that there, there's a lot of unhealthy red cedar in the southwest coast of Oregon. So I'd be, I'd, I would love to hear what you all are seeing and if you're concerned at all about this. But another project might be um, dieback in Western Hemlock, or there's some concern around um, the dieback or the die off of, of sword fern um, in some localized areas in the state. So those are just examples of other projects that you might hear about in the future. Generally, we're using this approach that um, you may refer to as citizen science. We, we decided to call it community science, um, but it's essentially the engagement of, of anyone. Anyone can participate um, and help advance and accelerate research. Um, I'll, I'll speak to how people are contributing um, to the Red Cedar Dieback Project in a minute, but. Generally, we just want to emphasize that anyone's welcome to participate. You don't need a scientific background at all. Um, clearly, master gardeners are, are switched on and would make great community scientists. So I would love it, um, love to hear your feedback and, and, and hear um, how this program could be useful or interesting to you. Within the Forest Health Watch program, you can sign up as a community scientist. You don't have to by any means to participate, but it's there if you want to be in a little bit closer touch with us. We have a newsletter you can subscribe to. There's some resources about climate change and forest health and invasive species. Um, we have a listserv where you can email each other or other people that are concerned about forest health. Um, and the idea is that you, you should be able to email this with a problem and others on the list serve can help troubleshoot it. Um, we also offer office hours. So a um, couple times a month where you have dedicated time where anyone can pitch up and ask us questions about the program or how to use iNaturalist, which I'll introduce in a second. Um, we also have a, a community office hour specifically for um, tribal members to come and ask questions or, or share perspectives about forest health. There's a space where you can upload um, unhealthy pictures of plants and we'll try our best to, to um, find answers. Um, again, our focus is really on trees, but um, if you did have something that was a native species, I would be, you know, I would do my best to help. Um, and there's, there's places like calls to actions where, um, if there's an invasive species that's introduced to the region, we might put something on there. Or if there's a, a call for more participation in research or monitoring, um, those kind of things might, might show up as call to action. We have research projects, which I'm going to introduce the Western Red Cedar dieback project in a minute. And then yesterday was the first of our research updates. So every month we have an open to the public um, presentation that that shares out everything that we're seeing um, and the patterns that are emerging from the community scientists' contributions. And then we also have collaborator updates every month or every, um, we've had two, we probably do it quarterly. So now I'm gonna switch gears and I'm gonna talk a little bit about Western Red Cedar um, specifically. Western Red Cedar is a, a pretty important species of the Northwest. It's really an iconic species, um, but 
perhaps it's most important because its role in the cultural heritage of the Northwest and, and its uses for indigenous peoples in the region. Um, here we see some photographs from the historical society um, of a canoe made from Western red cedars, housing made from Western red cedar, um, baskets and other storage uh, materials and, and other um, kind of forms of textiles were very common parts built or crafted from Western red cedar. I really like this diagram from Heidi Bohan, who um, emphasizes how Western red cedar is really used throughout the entire person, the entire life of a person. It's called the, the tree of life because there's, there's uses from the cradle to grave, essentially. Um, so there's just incredible utility from Western red cedar and it's a really critical um, species to, to the histories of the Northwest. In addition to the cultural history, it's also been fundamental to the industrial heritage of the Northwest, um, where you know a lot of industry in, in some of these coastal cities was born out of forestry um, and established through forestry. And Western Red Cedar was a pretty integral part of that. So we just want to acknowledge that Western Red Cedar is also really important because of that legacy. Um, in terms of the ecology, Western Red Cedar, sometimes you'll find almost pure stands, but generally it's mixed um, with other conifers, but it's contributing in a lot of ways um, by sus you know, sustaining the soil, um, adding to the nutrient cycling, filtering water and air, and of course, providing habitat to, um, to many species, even when they die, they're still used as important habitat. In cities, they're also critically important. Western red cedar um, constitutes more than 2,000 trees. Um, when you look at the street tree data in, in Seattle alone, um, this is street tree and iNaturalist data um, where there's more than 2,000 red cedar trees spread throughout the city. And they're all contributing pretty incredible services such as reducing the effects of heat islands and um, improving air quality and soil quality and things like that. Um, red cedar is also really widely distributed and it's important that we kind of, we do research on this species because it has such a enormous footprint in our region essentially. So just to summarize, Western red cedar is really important because it's a big part of our cultural legacy. It's also an important part of our industrial heritage. Um, contributes a lot of services ecologically in both urban and natural environments. And it has a really robust footprint um, in the region. So it's important to, to protect and conserve. However, um, we're concerned because there's been a lot of reports of dieback and, and sometimes we see entire trees dying. Sometimes we just see these canopies thinning and we can see through these trees more than we should be able to. Um, sometimes we'll see a tree with just the top dieback and, and um, over time that, that dieback will expand and grow and the tree will eventually succumb to, to and die. Sometimes we see trees within a forest, sometimes they're out in the open in a field, um, sometimes it's a small tree, sometimes it's a big tree. We, all these patterns are kind of complex and we're trying to identify where, where trees are vulnerable and where we should and should not plant them, for example. But the dieback is a, is a major concern and there's a lot of news sources that have illustrated this. Um, in some cases, the, the effects of droughts have been remarked as emergency and, and, and um, some news, local news headlines, you know, dead tree after dead tree, the case for Washington's dying foliage. It's caught, the dieback has caught the attention of uh, some of these important news sources and it's, it's drawing concern to the point where um, landowners and cities may not be planting Western red cedar because they're concerned with this dieback, which is kind of a tragedy when you consider all the reasons it's important. This has also been documented and demonstrated through the aerial survey data. So every year the state and the Forest Service partner and they fly airplanes over our forests and they map areas where they're seeing dieback. And this data, um, they started monitoring or looking for dieback of red cedar in 2017. Um, and then every year they just start seeing more. And whether that's because the, 
they're looking for it more or whether it's because they're, they're seeing more um, because it's getting worse is, is remains a question, but there is some support that it's getting worse. So what we've done is we um, partnered with the Forest Service and the state and um, Oregon Department of Forestry as well. And we co-developed this project on an already existing tool called iNaturalist. And so iNaturalist is a really neat smartphone application, but you can also just use it on your computer. And you can go there right now and you could search for Western Red Cedar and it would tell you there's 9,000 different observations of red cedar that people have shared using this tool. And you could look around um, Rainier or your neighborhood and you could be like, oh, there's a red cedar there and there and there. However, um, for our interest, we have no idea how healthy these red cedar trees are. There's a lot of trees and that data is there, but we don't know how healthy those trees are. So we created an additional project and this project, the way it works is you join the project um, or a, you, someone who's interested joins the project. And then when they add an observation of red cedar, they tag the project. And when they do that, it asks a couple questions. Um, one, it asks you, how healthy is the tree? It also asks you, what symptoms did you see? Did you see that the, the canopy was thin? Did you see that the top was dying back? or was the whole tree dead? Um, what did you see? It also asks you, were there other possible factors? You know, did you see a fungus growing on the tree or did you have some, some holes that were caused by a beetle? Did you see um, bark beetles? Did you see invasive species? Those kind of questions. We also ask about, you know, where is it growing? Is it in your yard? Is it next to a road? Is it in the middle of a field or a forest? And together, all these questions are really just helping us get an idea of the patterns for where this is occurring and why it's occurring there. And so what's happening is that we are seeing um, kind of these patterns emerge because community scientists are really helping accelerate this research. Um, and I encourage you to, to check it out. It's on iNaturalist. You can find it on Western Red Cedar dieback map. Um, but there's also um, within our webpage, there's other, there's other links to it, of course. So I'm just briefly going to illustrate um, quickly kind of what we're seeing so far. Um, so far, you can find a little visualization of the data on our webpage. It's foresthealth.org slash map. Slash analysis. Are, sorry, are you with me on the? Um, which can you see my browser? Yeah, we're good. We're seeing Western Red Cedar dieback map. Okay, and it, it says three twenty eight. Yep. Okay, wonderful. That worked better than I expected. So um, you can see in this this um, diagram that we don't have any observations from your areas yet. Um, so we don't really know what's going on with Western Red Cedar in your areas. Um, but so far we have about 300 observations um, in this kind of central, uh, well, Western Washington, um, Western Oregon, kind of Willamette Valley um, lowlands, I guess what you would say, the lowlands between the coast range and the, and the, um, the foothills of the Cascades. And so, um, so far 64 amazing people have contributed and we, um, we're really hoping to get about 2,000 observations, 2,021 observations this year. Um, so we're about 16% of our goal. Um, and I welcome you to come and check this out. This is on our webpage, it's just the analyses. We've done a little bit about what we're seeing too. Um, you know, we're also invite people to share pictures of healthy trees knowing where trees are healthy is almost as important as knowing where trees are unhealthy. And so there's just a little bit of data there. But for the sake of time, I'm gonna switch back and, and get through um, a couple more slides. Um, so while, you're, I, while you're switching though, I wanna note that in the chat, Chris, you were mentioning that you're saying we, we've lost a number of red cedars in Montesano. So it sounds like there's some actually value in reporting uh, that we could contribute to this. Yes, absolutely. Um, no, I'm really hoping that that um, some of you will walk away, and when you see a healthy or unhealthy red cedar, you'll 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 let us know because um, 
it's really, it really is urgent. It's a very important species and there's already, people are already making decisions not to plant because of the concerns with it. And so we, it's, it's a good example that of science being behind decisions. The decisions are being made ahead of the science. We don't know, you know, where these trees are vulnerable, um, but we know that it's a really important species to try and sustain. And so um, that's kind of the next, the next and, few parts and, of this. Program. And then clearly by your map, it's, it sounds like there's a real gap here in Grace Harbor and Pacific County. So there, there, there really would be an opportunity for us to contribute to this science um, yeah. given that obviously there's, there's a huge population of red cedars uh, in this area. Yeah. And if there's a way that I can support you all and so doing so, you know, I'm happy to give more presentations like this to more communities and um, we can do a Grays Harbor research update at some point if you, if you do want a summary of what comes out of that area. Um, but I'm gonna, I'm just gonna go through now and I'm gonna explain how these data are gonna be useful in the bigger picture and what we're gonna, you know, what this information is allowing us to do with the next steps. Um, so this will just take a minute or two, but are you with me on the um, kind of the outline where I have research objectives highlighted? Yep, that's what we're okay. seeing. Great, so essentially the way that this community science data um, will help is one, we're starting a good idea where um, healthy trees and unhealthy trees are on the landscape. So we're starting to get a distribution. And what's surprising is that people in Alaska on a call yesterday were indicating they're seeing top dieback and then all the way down to um, places like Corvallis and Salem. And so um, it's, you know, what's revealing that this is really a range wide issue. Um, what we don't know, you know, either is how, what's going on in the kind of the east side and apparently the range goes all the way over to Western Montana. And so we have, we need to engage more with communities out there. But it's also um, letting, helping us identify site conditions where trees are vulnerable. Um, these, don't take these graphs literally, they were made like really early on, but just to illustrate um, some of the questions we're trying, we're, we're looking for patterns in the slope and you know, our trees on, on slope sites, sites with with heavy slopes, um, more vulnerable are trees where um, in sites where it's really well drained, more vulnerable um, are trees where there's a lot of disturbance, where there you know trees next to parking lots um, versus trees out in the natural forest, <laughs> and and so those are kind of the the site conditions that we're starting to look for patterns and and see if anything emerges. We're also gonna use this data with overlay analyses where you can look at which environmental parameters explain where dieback is occurring the best. Um, and so with this, we can, we can start to ask, is precipitation more important or is temperature more important, for example? Is soil more important? <laughs> which, which parameters are out there that are really gonna help us determine why and where these trees are dying? And once we have an idea of where, um, which environmental parameters are important, then we can start to use tools like this seed lot selection tool, which essentially you can use um, to make decisions for where to get your seed. Um, I'm just, cause I know we're almost out of time. I'm just blowing through this, but I'm happy to answer more questions. And then finally, once we know where trees are vulnerable and also which environmental conditions are important, we can start to screen some of the populations against those parameters and we can see which ones are the most tolerant to drought or the most um, resistant to um, this soil type or some, you know, conditions like that. Um, we're also interested in, um, in June and July, we're gonna start inviting people to submit soil samples where we can start investigating if there's um, maybe fungi that are, that are contributing to this dieback. So essentially in the end, you know, together through this effort, we can all find solutions to, to ensure that Western Red Cedar remains in the landscape and for future generations. And I really encourage you all to, um, to get in touch with me, use, use us as a resource, join this program if you have time um, and help, help us accelerate this research. 
Oh, wait, let's open it up for questions here. I guess one of the first ones I wanted to ask is that um, is um, is the issues you're seeing here only with red cedar? What about yellow cedar or uh, Alaskan or any of the ornamentals, Atlas cedars and so forth? That that's a really great question. Um, we would love to know. We we haven't been documenting any of that yet, but we are thinking we um, we created a, a project on iNaturalist for Western Hemlock, and I think the next steps is starting to create projects for Douglas fir and some of the other species, so that there is a space for people to report when they see other things like that. I the the yellow cedar has even more limited range in Washington than Western red cedar, and so. Um, I do suspect that it's also having trouble and it, it might be even worse. So when you go around Seattle, sometimes I see um, Western red or yellow cedar or um, Port Orphan cedar dying. Um, and it, so it also seems like it's an issue, but um, we, we don't, I don't really have a good answer for that yet. Mm -hmm. So other questions, other comments from the folks here. I really appreciate Joey sharing here. And I clearly want to repeat this appeal that we join in on this, uh, on this, uh, on this, uh, on this iNaturalist um, initiative insofar as we have a lot of cedar, as we all know, here in these two counties. Comments and questions for Joey. Yeah, I have uh, our, our, our question. Uh, I've noticed in my neighborhood, uh, Douglas fir, silver fir, Western hemlock, even some ornamentals like giant sequoia, our tops are dying. And uh, I tough the uh, root rot. What did you say, Jude? Root rot. That and uh, the pathologist that we had here from the DNR uh, said it was uh, our springs have been drier than normal and they were getting uh, a lot of dieback from that dryer. But I just wondered what your thoughts are on that, Joey. Well, if Dan Omdahl was out there and he looked for pathogens and root rot and still and suggested it was dr because it was dry, I would I would go with what Dan Omdahl says or the forest the state forest pathologist. But um, we you know when you drive down I five you see a lot of top dieback and dug fur and like Chehalis and Centralia area and I I think that's a similar story. And I, that's why I feel like we should start documenting this so that we can actually um, start looking at the, the, the data and making some more informed decisions about where to plant and what to plant. Um, my, my recommendation is that if you're gonna plant stuff, you know, plant as much diversity as you can, get your seeds from all over. Um, don't plant the same cultivar everywhere in the city. Um, just in case that that cultivar is susceptible to, you know, droughts and things like that. But given that you're seeing it on multiple species, it does sound like it's an abiotic thing, like um, like drought or or you know reduced water availability. But um, as Jude said, root rot is not helping. If anything, these fungi are probably having bigger impacts now because the trees are becoming more stressed. Um, and, and, and <laughs> when, you, when water is limited, you need all the roots you can get. You, know, you don't wanna be losing them to root rot. So controlling for root rot might also um, help mitigate against the, the reduction of water. So I had, a, I had a question for you. Earlier in your presentation, you mentioned uh, sudden, oak, sudden oak syndrome and uh, when I lived in California, I used to frequent Elkhorn Slough uh, to do bird watching and just to hike. And we were required upon entering to dip our boots into a, to clean our feet before we thing. And then also to kill any fungus that might be on our feet. Is there, is, is that applicable here? I think that's, that's a really good practice. And if there was a park that you're a friends of a park or something where you want to protect and we can encourage them to install boot stations like that, that would not hurt. I don't think um, we're at risk as much for that sudden oak death pathogen, but that practice of cleaning your boots and preventing the spread of things on accidentally on the soles of your boots and things like that is a good practice. Really, when it comes to protecting these these trees and these forests, it's on us. It's like a, a shared responsibility for everyone, um, just to be responsible and careful about what you're accidentally moving around. 
and those boot washing stations are nice. I just sent an email to Seattle Parks and also Tacoma Parks highlighting um, those boot stations, not only for pathogens, but also for seeds from invasive species like scotch broom yeah. and things like that. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I definitely respect that and I'm happy to hear that California was doing that. I would love to see more, more of that kind of behavior and, and accessibility in Washington. Thank you. Other questions, comments for Joey? Again, his you know his contact information is available at uh, at at um, uh, you know at that uh, at, 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 uh, I can I'll certainly make it available in terms of our, our publications here. But I think you've got it uh, you've got it here in the at, um, in the chat here. Yeah, um, you're welcome to email me if I can. Um, I can help. We got. You can also contact us through the Forest Health Watch webpage or the Pialip Research and Extension webpage. Yeah. Joey, thank you so very much for joining us. And again, a shout out is that uh, we're hoping to have Joey back in May for a, an actual workshop, a clinic that we can actually go into more detail on some of this information and it, um, and again, uh, engage us more, uh, more intently. Um, it's great having you with in this expertise, Joey, you know, at the, in, in the, in the, on the, in, in, in the, in the program here, how long is your fellowship uh, expected to last year? Are you, you linked in for how long here with us? Well, we're really, I, I want this to be a career. So we're trying to, to make it last, but right now I have support until June, 2022. Um, so a little more than a year, but uh, this Friday we're submitting another grant and it's, it's a hustle, but, but um, we're trying really hard. Very good. So we're gonna we're gonna take advantage of you while we got you. <laughs> we're gonna be doing. Absolutely, okay, Joey. Well, thanks much. Thank you. And so I want to I want to thank everybody for joining us here. You know, at uh, today, um, and at uh, what we're gonna do is it uh, is it uh, is uh, move on to the it uh, you know, is to is to move on uh, fr from our our formal meeting here. Um, I'll make a note here that, um, you know, that I've, uh, um, uh, we've got, we've, we've recorded this, uh, uh,